to Collected Talks of David Solomon, podcasts on topics ranging from Jewish history and the Bible to Jewish mysticism, philosophy, and thought. To find out about David's talks, books, and more, visit davidsolomon.online. And now, here's the lecture. Leah told me that the basic feedback is that people are coming out saying, I really don't understand what he's talking about, but I'm enjoying it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I've got to tell you that this, this course is one of the hardest that I've had to prepare for because the... No, it's not just because it's short, but because the material is just difficult, especially these last couple of talks. And then I realised that really the preparation for these talks is taking decades. It's not, um, it's not something that I can, you know do intensely and therefore to give it over, I've always, always struggled to give over Kabbalistic and mystical concepts because you need, they're immersive and you need a background in them. But we've done very well. Last week we took it much slower. So what I want to do is pick up where we left off um, last week and just to uh, remind us, fortunately, uh, Leah left the uh, diagram I did of the Sfirot on the uh, board. So uh, that's really our starting point. And I want to uh, talk just for a moment uh, about, in terms of encounters with the divine, and I said last week that really there's a turning point in the 13th century where encounters with the divine tend to become collective, and I want that to be understood because it means that really, for the last seven, eight hundred years, we have been dealing with what we might call a, a national or collective cultural turn towards the mystical. Before the 13th century, there seems to have been a far greater um, division in Jewish thought between the rational and the mystical, between the legal and the revealed traditions, your basic halakha, your mishnah, your just general Torah studies, uh, the spirituality that belonged to all of those traditions that came out of the Second Temple period, out of the Talmud and the Gaonic period. And that was pretty much where uh, most people resided. Then you had a few individuals who were inclined towards mystical experiences. They experimented, they thought about things, they received their own revelations, their own influences from their own teachers and that they handed down to their own students. Very, very small schools. Mystical thinking had not pervaded the general geist of Jewish thought. But that changed in the 13th century and beyond due to an overwhelming, the overwhelming influence of this remarkable text called the Zohar. Now, the Jewish people are not like other people. I don't know if, that, I don't know if you've noticed that. It's not the case that we have, you know, prophecy, which of course is an encounter with the divine, thousands of years ago and we are always looking back towards that prophetic experience Jewish history is dynamically engaged dynamically engaged with divine revelation that means that divine revelation can happen at any time and in a sense shift our perception of things and drive us deeper towards an understanding of what we're doing in the world. Because all divine revelation really comes down to that. The divine is the source of meaning. And if the, you have a revelation that deepens your understanding of meaning in the world, what you're doing in the world, what the world represents, what the purpose of humanity is, those revelations are deeply impactful and uh, in a sense mystical uh, because as we've seen mysticism is about accessing uh, a reality that is more authentic yeah 
How does the Zohar begin? The Zohar begins with the word, with the verse that it takes from the Song of Songs. Yep. There's a verse in the Song of Songs that says, "Kishoshana ben Achochim kin ra'agati ben Abanot." Like the rose among the thorns, so is my beloved among the daughters. All right? And the Zohar unpacks this in a way that makes it clear that the rose among the thorns is, of course, the people of Israel. And if you look at the end of the 13th century, you will see that it reaches a critical juncture in the clash of civilizations between Islam and Christianity. Can you imagine a world in which those two civilizations are clashing? In the 13th century, we find that we have arrived kind of at the end of the 200-year saga of the Crusades. But more specifically, more specifically, where is the Zohar revealed? Where does it emerge from? What part of the world does it emerge from? Spain. And what has happened to Spain in the 13th century? By the middle of the 13th century, we see the completion of the second Reconquista. That is, that the force, Christian forces that have come down from the north have eventually, it's a long process, it took about a century, but eventually they have conquered Spain. If you ask them, they would say they reconquered Spain, but they conquered Spain. So that by the time you get to the 1250s, you've already got James of Aragon, the, the man they call the Hammer of the Moors, and so on. By around the 1250s onwards, except for one little isolated uh, pro, uh, principality of Granada, basically all of Spain is now Christian. So the Jews that have been living there... And since the invasion of the Moors, which happened in, in the famous year 711, since the invasion of the Moors, Spain had been more or less Islamic. The Christians had tried to overtake it during the 11th century in the first Reconquista, but in the 13th they succeeded finally. What that means is that the Jewish community of Spain, which during that period had undergone its golden age and so on, the Jewish community of Spain had seen itself caught between these two great, uh, these clash of these two great religions, spiritual systems and civilizations. But it wasn't just happening in Spain, because, and what historians often forget to remind people, including themselves, is that it, this conflict was mirrored on the other side of the Mediterranean in the Crusades over the Holy Land. And in fact, if you look at the history of it, it's a seesaw. So as the Muslims are up in Spain, they're down in the Holy Land. And when they're up in the Holy Land, they're down in Spain. And when we come out of the 13th century, that's precisely what's happened. Islam has lost Spain and the crusading armies of Europe have lost the Holy Land. And so that line that gets drawn around 1290 is a line that most historians regard as the end of the Crusades. That, that is the year in which they also regard as the revelation of the Zohar. So in terms of historical circumstances, that's a major background issue and that's reflected to some extent in the text. But it doesn't explain, doesn't explain the emergence of the Zohar on a conceptual level. As we looked last week, we see the rise in uh, Provence and in north e southern France and in northeastern Spain. We see the rise of a whole composite of mystical systems and thinking that were shifting away from what had been earlier forms of Jewish mysticism, such as Merkava mysticism and so on, rather than people going up. Yep they're able to contemplate and shift their consciousness here to encounter the divine and have an apprehension of the divine here. Now, it's very, very difficult, and I would be foolish to try to give over a summary of the Zohar in a minute. I've got to tell you, I know that's disappointing for some of us, 
but you can read as many encyclopedia articles as you like on the Zohar, but it won't, it won't explain to you what the Zohar is, because the Zohar is fundamentally experiential. It is, in effect, a massive, poetic and sublime text whose starting point is the condition of the people of Israel, the Jewish people in the world, and its relationship with the divine. However, having said that, it is a text on the surface is accessible. And it's accessible if you just realize and some of you are going to listen to these words but not quite understand them, you can understand it if you realize that what the Zohar does is it takes the symbolic pattern and structure of the Sefirot, which, if you look, for example, at the earlier Sefirotic literature, we talked last week a little bit about the Bayir, if you take, the, uh, whereas earlier they've gone, okay, so you have these emanations from God, let's just meditate and descend through those emanations. If you understand that structure, by, the Zohar takes it and it applies it dynamically to the Torah, so that the Sefirah of Chesed becomes embodied in Abraham, and the Sefirah of Gvurah becomes embodied in Isaac. In other words, actually it doesn't become embodied, Isaac is the Sefirah of Gvurah. Yeah? So the Torah's revelation is a revelation about the Sefirot themselves, and the Sefirot are the way that God interacts with the world. They are God's divine creative potentialities, and they, what, is the, what is the ultimate reflection of the Sefirot in terms of God's creative potentiality? What is the ultimate reflection of that? The human. The human. In other words, we are the ultimate reflection of the microcosmic package of, of God's, the revelation of God's creative powers and potential. The divine image that Genesis talks about is the Sfirot. And the Sfirot are completely reified uh, modalities of creative potential. So is the human being. Now, then you realize that the Zohar is built on that structure. So when you read the Zohar and you understand that, it actually becomes mesmerizingly amazing. Apart from the fact that you've got all these webbies wandering around some mythical Galilean and Palestinian landscape in the second century, encountering all sorts of mystical characters you know, they'll encounter a camel driver or, 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 or a donkey driver who, after two hours of walking with him, realize that he's one of the great spiritual giants of the world, but he's just here as a camel, as a, as a donkey driver. They encounter, encounter young children who are fully, fully developed spiritual avatars. The whole thing is just immensely dreamlike and mystical. So I can't talk too much about the Zohar in terms of what it is because it just you have to immerse yourself in it. It's a totally different world. But what it did, what it did was it completely shifted the consciousness of the Jewish world. It started pervading our language, our spiritual language, our customs, Look, I'll give you an example, right? What's Lag Baomer? What's special about the 33rd day of the Omer? What, 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 what's its halachic, halachic implication? That is, what is its outcome in Jewish law, Lag Baomer? What, is it, what does it do? Correct. The laws of mourning that apply between Passover and Shavuot are suspended for that day. So you can get married, you can have a haircut, whatever you want to do, right? Now, the whole basis of the laws of mourning between Pesach and Passover and, and Shavuot are because Rabbi Akiva's students were dying in a plague and that plague stopped on Lag Baomer, yeah? But a lot of people are no longer aware of that. Lag Baomer has become synonymous 
with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the attributed author of the Zohar, because that was the day on which he passed away. There are some very special sections of the Zohar. In other words, the whole of the Zohar is mystical, and then you've got certain sections of it that go up several levels in mystical power and content. Two of those sections are called the Idra sections of the Zohar. This is all known by Zohar scholars and so on, and people who read the Zohar. There are two sections of the Zohar. The Zohar is massive, which are called the Idra. There is the Idra Rabba, which is the greater Idra, and the Idra Zuta, which is the lesser Zuta. In the Idra Rabba, in the Great Assembly, Rabbi Shimon gathers around him a few of his close students and says, I'm now going to reveal to you something from a completely different level of revelation. And he blasts them with this incredibly complex picture of the Sfirot in the divine realms. It's very, very opaque. It's very mystical. In the course of that revelation, one of two of his students, actually the revelation is so great of what he's telling them, that one or two of them expire. In the Idra Zuta, Rabbi Shimon himself says, I'm going to now give over a revelation and I'm not coming back from this revelation. Imagine that. And one of you, he says to the group in front of him, is coming with me. You're not going to make it out of this revelation. They're sitting down in a field under a tree. We know, we're, 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 they're in physical reality. He goes, well, by the end of this drasha, I'm not going to be in this world anymore. My body will be here. I'll be dead. But my soul, and you, and he points to one of the students, you're coming with me. Right? Now, in the Indra Zuta, it's like the Indra Rabba on crack. <laughs> So he can, now we can read these revelations, but they're very, very, very difficult to understand. In fact, they are so difficult to understand that for the first couple of centuries after the revelation of the Zohar, pretty much even high-level Kabbalists were admitting that although they know that there are tremendous revelations here, they're not accessing them. They're not unlocking those revelations. And that happens until the middle of the 16th century. And I don't need to tell you that the 16th century was a very special century. A very special century. Has anyone seen my course on the 16th century? So you know that the 16th century is phenomenal. Phenomenal. What's happening in the 16th century? And it's all about the Zohar. Not, not, it's not the 16th century is all about the Zohar, but what I'm about to talk about isn't just, although we've jumped 300 years, we're not opening a new story here. We're just opening a new chapter of an existing story of this collective revelation that has happened to the Jewish people. What's happening in the 16th century? World exploration, big century of change. The Reformation, I mean, that change is happening in, the, in, in Europe. There's cracks appearing all over the place. In religion, in art, in science. I mean, we're now hitting the height of the Renaissance. It's all everywhere. Now, the expulsion from Spain is an event that, for us over 500 years afterwards, we sometimes don't always appreciate just how catastrophic and impactful that was. I know that for us living in the early 21st century, it, as Jewish people, 
it's sometimes difficult for us to look beyond historically beyond the Holocaust which happened which which I mean we are still living very much in the shadow of to understand how earlier catastrophic events affected Jewish life and history but the expulsion from Spain is a major tectonic shift in the Jewish world and it unleashed a huge number of elemental forces in Jewish thought. One of those unquestionably was in the realm of mystical thought and it would appear that a lot of the mystical thought that was being revolutionized at the beginning of the 16th century had a lot to do with the rise of messianic tension. It's no question that the end, the events at the end of the 15th and the beginning of the 16th in this world that is fundamentally changing and undergoing turmoil gave rise to a lot of messianic speculation. After the expulsion from Spain, what city became the center of the Jewish world for the next couple of hundred years? Saloniki. So profound was Salonika, in fact, that it was called for a couple of centuries the mother of Israel. It was a profoundly influential community, and certainly in the it waned a bit in the 17th century, but in the 16th century, everybody went through Salonika. And many of the great spiritual leaders and sages that came out of Spain found themselves in Salonika. Now, I'm talking, when I say found themselves in Salonika, I'm now going to move to a particular form of encounter. We're just going to put the Zoharic continuum on hold for a moment. The Zohar has been around now for two, three hundred years. People are fascinated by it. They are immersed in it. They have incorporated parts of it into the liturgy. That's how important and canonical it became. If you think about it, ladies and gentlemen, it is amazing that a text that was unknown before the 13th century, within 200 years, becomes canonically identified with the Mishnah, is regarded as absolutely authentically a product of the second century and a full revelation of the divine and is so canonized that it's even incorporated into the Siddur. Do you think it would be possible to do that today? It would be very difficult. But... That was an earlier age, and they had other things going on, but it's also a testament to the overwhelming nature of the Zohar. In fact, it's one of the reasons why people argue that it could not have been written by any single individual, because it's so overwhelmingly profound. It really, really is. It shows you that every single verse of the Bible has an almost infinite possibilities of mystical reading now but I'm going to footnote I'm just want to move not to a footnote but I just want to digress for a moment because in the early 16th century we see the rise also due to messianic tension of another kind of mystical encounter with the divine that I want to talk about yep that's kind of separate from the Zohar the people I'm going to talk about it's not like they didn't know the Zohar but they're doing something a little different and that is they are, some of them are returning to more individualized forms of mystical speculation that we might find in Abulafian techniques. But instead of just reaching some kind of intellectual unio mystica or bliss or prophetic consciousness, they bring down, they bring down 
to themselves what's called and tell me if you've heard this name a magid what is a magid? the word magid is from the verb lahagid meaning to tell so a magid is a teller yeah and it's a name applied often to a teacher like an itinerant preacher in Europe that used to go around from didn't live in any one place and was literally like a wandering preacher yep would rock up and say I'm here in town yep it's got the, there's some very famous like the Magid of, um, of Dubno is the, you know one of the most famous ones who's heard of the Magid of Dubno yep or as my dad would call her Maggie of Dubbo <laughs> but that the, the Magid of Dubno is an 18th century figure that's much later but the concept of a Magid in terms of Kabbalistic thought <coughs> and the type of uh, experiences and encounters that we're talking about is a <coughs> heavenly companion that attaches itself to you and reveals mysteries out of your mouth. Now we start to see in the 16th century some of these mystical sages developing techniques by which they can access the Magidic revelations and experiences. In the best light, the Magid is seen as an embodiment of Torah in some form. Now, the rabbi that first we first encounter this in the 16th century is a remarkable individual. I'm not going into their life particularly now, called Rabbi Yosef Taitatzak. And Rabbi Yosef Taitatzak came out of Spain, did a lot of work with magical squares and stuff, and eventually ended up in Salonika, where he was teacher to a whole new generation of, myst of, of young mystics. And he had a mugging. We don't know a lot about his mugging. But one of his students in that field, we do know about. And we know a lot about his Magid because he wrote an entire book on it. A book called Magid Mesharim. I'm going very particularly here carefully now because I want everyone's attention. Because it may shock you to know who that individual was that had a Magid and worked so, towards, worked so hard towards getting one and wrote an entire book based on his divine heavenly revelations. And when people find this out, they go, Ah! Oh. That person, who also came out of Spain, but very, very young, at the time of the expulsion he was only four, and his parents went to the Ottoman Empire and he grew up in the Balkans and eventually found himself in Salonika where he was able to learn the Magidic techniques from Rabbi Yosef Taitatzak who was much older but that individual went on to become much more famous in a different field not mysticism that person is Yosef Karo Yosef Karo put up your hand if you do not know who Yosef Karo is good that gives me a reason for being here. Yosef Karo is the author of a work called the Shulchan Aruch. The Shulchan Aruch is the great, the last universally accepted synthesis or code of Jewish law. Everything of the last 500 years in Jewish legal practice and in Jewish ritual practice has been built on the foundational work of the Shulchan Aruch. Yosef Karo had a Magid, and he tells us very, very, in great detail in his book, Magid Meshari, which I believe has been translated, he tells us how he got the Magid and the things that the Magid was saying. He got his Magid, and this is a very, very, very interesting technique. And of all the techniques I'm telling you, this is the one 
that works. I've tried it. I haven't got as far as Yosef Karo did. I haven't been privy to a Magid speaking out of my mouth, although sometimes it feels like it. <laughs> but definitely altered states of consciousness and awareness are achievable by his technique. And his technique is fully based on the Mishnah. What is the Mishnah? What is the Mishnah? The oral law written down in succinct form in the second century. That's nearly 2,000 years ago. The oral law written down in succinct form, thousands and thousands of tiny paragraphs. So, Yosef Karo would spend hours and hours every day mantraizing, if such a verb is permitted, mantraizing, everybody knows what I mean by that verb, reciting it again and again and again, fully conscious of the words, but using it like a mantra and reciting it until the, Mish until the Mishnah itself, the Mishnah itself, we don't understand what that is, some kind of disembodied spiritual entity that is the Mishnah entered into him and spoke through him. I mean, he spent years on this. He would take one Mishnah, not for all the years, but like for days at a time, one Mishnah, and just go over it and over it and over it until it was, he was somewhere deep, deep, deep lost inside. It's, it's textual mantraizing is a technique. Verbalizing, or just verbalizing it, thinking about it, verbalizing it constantly. But you've got to bear in mind that he's coming to that practice with an awareness of the whole Talmud. So he's bringing that about. about, about it's, you know what it's like? You know what it's like? I'm, I'm going to give you an analogy. But in contemporary physics, sometimes when they try and find out new things or discover elemental forces, they will put a lot of power, a lot of power, as much power as they can put on as small a space as they can. Do you understand? Like, you know, to try and break open whatever's there. He seemed to do that mentally with the Mishnah. So he would say, you know, you're Yosef Karo. You're one of the greatest sages. The Talmud is in your head. You know the whole thing. And then you would bring all of that and concentrate it on one paragraph of two or three lines. And mantras it, mantras it, mantras it. Now, he wrote an entire book on this. It's really quite astonishing. One of the most famous Magidic experiences that he had was in Salonika in the 1530s. By the way, uh, there is literature where uh, Yosef Karo asked his own Magid what he thought of the Magid of Yosef Taitatzak. And that Magid said, ah, you know, not such a serious level Magid. <laughs> and apparently Yosef Taitatzak had the same conversation with his Magid, who also said of Yosef Karo's Magid. Ah, no. <laughs> but they were all together with other famous figures such as Shlomo al -Kabetz. Shlomo al -Kabetz. Who is Shlomo al -Kabetz? He is the author of L'cha Dodi. Yep. There is no sid... This is a hymn that is sung on Friday night as Shabbat is coming in. It's a beautiful, beautiful hymn of ten stanzas, all based on the Svirot. All based on the Svirot, by the way. If you don't know the Sfirot, you won't understand the Dodi except on the surface. But even on the surface, it's a stunningly beautiful poem. But the Dodi, is there a Sidur in the world? Sephardic, Ashkenazic, Orthodox, Conservative, whatever you want. Is there a Sidur in the world that does not have the Dodi in it? No. But the Dodi was written in the 16th century. That's only 500 years ago. We are a dynamically engaged people and we must be, remain so. 
it's, in, it's almost impossible to imagine today that someone could write a prayer that in half a century is going to be incorporated in every single Siddur in the world. But in the 16th century, that is the power of the collective power of what these guys were doing, concentrated in Salonika. And in, on one very, very famous year, well, one very famous festival of Shavuot in Salonika, all of these sages decided that they would stay up all night on Shavuot and study the Zohar. That was the reinstitution of a, ser- a, a ritual that we now call what? Where do you think the whole idea of Tikkun Nel Shavuot comes from? Is it mentioned in the Talmud? No. Where is it first mentioned, the whole idea of Tikkun Nel Shavuot, staying up all night on Shavuot, which is almost universal in the Jewish world? Where was that first mentioned, that whole idea? I'll let you guess, given what I'm talking about. The Zohar. But it hadn't been in practice. So these rabbis come along and they go, oh, let's do that. Let's stay up all night and study the Torah like it says in the Zohar. And they do that at that Tikkun Lel Shavuot, which was the first Tikkun Lel Shavuot in Salonika in around 1534. They're in the middle of studying the Zohar and suddenly <coughs> Yosef Karo's Magid decides to come out and say what it thinks. And what do you think it said? It told them all, what are you doing in Salonika? You need to go to the land of Israel. That then precipitates the whole spiritual rejuvenation of the north of Israel and particularly of Tzfat. So that by the time we get to the 1540s and the 1550s and the 1560s and the 1570s, for most of the next few decades, Yosef Karo goes to Tzfat, Shlomo al Kabetz goes to Tzfat, and in Tzfat, they and others completely revolutionize Jewish spirituality according to mystical revelations. There is, uh, we're going to take a break in a, five, in a couple of minutes. There is one more um, figure that is famously associated with a Magid. Do not get confused. I'm jumping now in time, not because we're jumping in time thematically, but I'm jumping in time because I'm just on the Magid theme. Yeah? But if we go to the 18th century, one of the most famous figures of the 18th century who could have had, could have basically an entire talk just dedicated to themselves, is Moshe Chaim Lutzato, Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato. He's known as the Ramchal. All right, he had a Magid. He had a Magid that he got from his deep studies of the Zohar. That Magid came to him and dictated to him an entire new Zohar which he wrote down. He called it Zohar Tinyana, the second Zohar. We're not going into the Ramchal right now, but Magidic techniques have become a very, very interesting part of Jewish thought. We have not heard... I've, I've got to tell you that one of the things that has a bit ruined the mystery for us is 20th century psychiatry. Because if someone came and they said they had a voice dictating a Zohar to them, they'd be in the Nut House. Yes. And they'd take, be taking, at the very best, they might be in this talk, but they'd be taking meds. But then, in, as, you know, in the 18th century, you could be highly, highly respected as a sage and have a Magid that reveals to you all these incredible texts. The other possibility is that you could be writing these texts and you could be saying it's a Magid. We also have documented a lot of cases of what's called automatic writing, which Abu Lafia spoke about. But not just permutation of letter, but that actually, in fact, it's very possible, so a lot of scholars believe that even entire sections of the Zohar were written through automatic writing. When we come back from the break, we're going to go back to the 16th century, 
because as you know, as you know, someone turns up in Tzfat in the 16th century with the keys to the Zohar. With the keys to the Zohar and the intersections and the Sifar Ditzniuta and all of the very difficult sections of the Zohar. They turn up in Tzfat and that, ladies and gentlemen, changes everything. Because the last 450 years of Jewish mystical thought has only really been concerned with the overwhelming revelations of the Ari, of Isaac Luria. When we come back from the break, we're going to look at Lurianic Kabbalah and how that, as a collective, individual and collective encounter with the divine, completely shifted Jewish thought. And then hopefully we will also have time to cover some uh, elements of uh, Hasidic thoughts, encounters with the divine on a mystical level. But uh, we'll take a break, five, ten minutes, and uh, we'll come back on that note. All right. So we have only this remaining time to cover. How is it that some projects, some intellectual projects in the Jewish world get uh, marginalized? and some become adopted universally. What is the secret behind that? What is it about certain types of intellectual influences and systems of thought that they suddenly become incorporated into our entire mode of thinking and become, for all intents and purposes, uh, an inner part of the core of, of Jewish continuum? So that going forward, there's no possibility of, of, of extracting them uh, and in a way almost every fundamental element of Jewish thought is like that and at some point became incorporated. What is it about those elements that does that? And I think that a key to understanding that is to look at Jewish thought's incredible propensity towards synthesis. It is simply not the case. Despite what your local rabbi might tell you, that Judaism is a monolithic entity that has always been the way it is. We synthesize elements, we incorporate elements constantly. We are dynamic and changing. But the ones that really, really take on are the projects, the intellectual projects that attempt to synthesize and incorporate everything that went before them. It's not the case that they're saying they're going to stake a claim and say, I'm only going with that or with this. They come up with a way of looking at the world where everything prior makes sense in relation to the new idea. You follow what I'm saying? They are, in a sense, theories of everything. And that is really, to understand that point, is to understand the two massively influential projects that emerged from Tzfat in the 16th century. On the one hand, Yosef Karo's Shulchan Aruch, that we talked about before the break, which goes on to become the, not a, but the universal code of Jewish law. And the other, of overwhelming influence in the way that we look at things, is the system developed and taught by Isaac Luria. Isaac Luria, who we know, Rabbi Isaac Luria, who we know by the acronym of the Ari. The Ari, another word Ari means lion, but he's called the Ari because it's an acronym that stands for Elohi Rabbi Yitzchak, the godly Rabbi Isaac. He is the only person in Jewish history who has that moniker. 
the only person who's called the godly. It is remarkable that that individual lived only 500 years ago, which is pretty late in Jewish history. But he changed everything. And he turned up in Tzvat in around the year 1570, now, which is also kind of late in the spiritual and mystical development of what had been going on in Tzvat. Just giving you a bit of historical context, you understand the nature of this revelation. We can't spend too long on the historical context because I want to talk about the actual content of his revelation and how it affects things. But he had just spent basically about 10 years. He was a young man when he turned up. He was only in his early 30s. But he had just spent about 10 years living more or less in a hut on the Nile in Egypt. Just him and his copy of the Zohar. The Zohar had been printed for the first time in 1558 in Mantua and Cremona. Whether or not the Ari sat in the Nile with a manuscript copy or with one of the new f fancy printed copies, we're not sure. But he turned up in Tzvat. Now, in Tzvat already there existed some considerable mystics and great, great Zohar scholars. The greatest of them all, who still has an extremely enduring legacy in Zoharic scholarship and in Jewish thought generally, is Rabbi Moses Cordovero. Now, what Rabbi Moses Cordovero had done was he had written a book, a text, which was the first attempt to try and synthesize all what we understand from the Zohar in the last two and a half centuries since its revelation. Yeah? And that book is called Pardes Rimonim. What is the meaning of Pardes Rimonim? An orchard of pomegranates. Yep. Yeah? And Pardes Rimonim, which is, it's, it's actually taken from, uh, that, that, that um, title is taken from a, a phrase used in the Book of Song of Songs. And he, in Pardes Rimonim, he basically took everything we know about the Zohar to its most comprehensive and clear level. He also tried to weld that with some notions of philosophy, Neoplatonic philosophy. He didn't call it that, but he has a big theory of emanations and he tries to help us understand what the Zohar is saying. When Isaac Luria turned up, and Isaac Luria turned up just a few months before Rabbi Moses Cordovero passed away. And most people thought that this young man from Egypt, who turned up in Tzvat in 1570, like so many other young spiritual seekers were turning up, that he was there to learn from some of the great sages. Yosef Karo was still alive. Rav Shlomo al Kabetz was still there. Many other great mystics were still living in Tzvat. And this young man turns up and they said, okay, well, you know, you choose yourself a teacher and you sit and learn. Tzvat had become a kind of like a Jewish um, Varanasa. What's the name of that huh? Indian uh, city where everybody goes? Uh, Varanasa, yeah. So you turn up and you find, you find somewhere to live and you find a teacher and you learn. So uh, the Ari kind of kept a low profile for the first few months. But it was really only after the passing of Rabbi Moses Cordovero, the greatest mystic sage of Tzfat, in 1570, that shortly after that, that the Ari, in a sense, revealed who he was. And it very soon became clear that he was not there to learn. He was there to teach. And he created a very small select group of students although awareness of this group soon became uh, extensive but 
to get into his inner circle wasn't easy. It was very, very individually selected. And over the course of the next 22 months, so less than two years, he downloaded to them, and that's a word borrowed from modern parlance, but there really is no other word bird to explain this. He downloaded to them this incredible vision of the divine, and then he died at about the age of, uh, actually, uh, he, he probably turned up when he was about 36, and he died at the age of 38. Now, he predicted his own death a few days before. He said, that's it, I've done what I came to the world to do, and he's gone. There's all sorts of mystical reasons behind it. He may have passed away in a plague, he may have been unwell, we don't know what the biological reasons were. Now, I'm going to try and... Uh, exp there's no way we can go into the detail of this. These are thousands and thousands of pages recorded by his students. But they do amount to some very, very critical points. And I just want to take a, a, a side note for a minute because um, once, one, to highlight the fact that these mystical encounters with the divine that we have been seeing since the Zohar have affected national consciousness and national directions. In other words, they're directly responsible for the fact that Tzfat in the 16th century became this influential place and that subsequently affected all the following centuries of Jewish thought. But to talk also about some of the more acute mystical experiences that some of his students were having, and notably his foremost disciple, the person that has come down to us as the foremost disciple of the Ari, because the Ari wrote very little down probably didn't have time to write down because if you look at the quantity and the profundity of the information he had to impart he didn't really have much time to write things down and that student is Rabbi Chaim Vital V-I-T-A-L Chaim Calabresi Vital his father was Joseph of Calabria they came from Calabria and Chaim Vital had actually been born in Svat and he grew up with a mystical urgings, and his first kind of projects were in alchemy. He's dabbling around there, but whether he's around 30 years old when the Ari turns up, and once the Ari turns up, he realizes that, he, and the Ari tells him, you're only on this world to be my student. After the Ari died, Chaim Vital spent the next 50 years in Damascus and other places, writing and trying to make sense of the notes that he took in the less than two years that he spent almost every waking minute with the Ari. Now, anybody who talks about the Ari and uh, talks about him in incredible terms, it's very difficult for us to get close to the personality of the individual because the closer you get to that personality uh, people are just too much in awe to write about it in a way that we could try and make sense of it but we're talking about a very 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 elevated soul but he gave Chaim Vital various spiritual exercises one of those and it's not something I recommend uh, there was a practice that uh, was developed where you would prostrate on the graves of the righteous. If you prostrate on the graves of the righteous, certain righteous, and you utter certain formulas which are combinations of divine names, Chaim Vital wanted proof from the Ari that the revelations that he was giving him were authentic. So the Ari said to him, go to this particular grave, prostrate yourself on it, and utter these words. And he did that. We'll see this technique also it comes in later. But he did that, and he describes in quite some detail what happened to him as soon as he uttered those words, both physiologically and spiritually. 
he went into an immediate catatonic state. His tongue started doing its own thing and his consciousness became immediately taken over by supernal entities that were filling his mind with these incredible visions uh, of uh, angels and mystical experience. In other words, the Ari said, you know, you could work for years and years and years to see this. I'm just going to give you a shortcut, move straight in, do that, and within minutes you'll be there. So Chaim Vital spends, uh, you know, in, in, a book, in a book which he writes called The Gates of Holiness, uh, in, which is a kind of a spiritual autobiography, the Sha'are Kedushah, he talks about these kinds of techniques and these kinds of things that the Ari was getting him to do. But that's not, that, that, that was his own personal journey. What I want to talk about is the wider conceptual nature of the revelation that the Ari had. And this is, go, I'm going to now talk for five minutes about something that some of you will understand and some of you will struggle to understand. But we'll try and make it as basic as possible. The Zohar, and, and you will see how powerful this encounter with the divine is, the Zohar's starting point is the condition of the people of Israel in the world. It's very existential, the Zohar. It tries to work out the nature of that relationship. Israel, God, the world. But it uses the Jewish people as the starting point. Our factuality in the world. We're in exile. There's a mystical reason behind that. How do we understand from the great passages in the, the passages in the Torah which talk about exile and the divine presence and remember I mentioned this last week that everything for the Zohar is about the unity between Tiferet and Malchut and in a sense we are Malchut and God is Tiferet or God is immanentized in the world and this this relationship is expressed in the Zohar in a great many ways in a, using a great many metaphors and analogies, some of which are unashamedly erotic. No one who is prudish. I remember I said last week that if the human form and the human existence is the ultimate metaphor of the divine, and that, in fact, erotic and sexual union is the ultimate metaphor of the unity of everything then they took that metaphor to the max but also in every other way as well you know the concept of family the concept of this and that now the Ari starting point however is somewhere else the Ari starting point in almost all systems that he comes down to us, and he comes down to us primarily through Vital's writings, but also through some of the other students as well. The Ari starting point is God. Because the Ari is trying to work out, or well, not trying to work out, he's he's not working out, he's just telling you. How God creates the world. Now, you might say, oh, well, we know that, because all we have to do is open the first chapters of Genesis, and you see how God creates the world. But for the Ari, that's not really, uh, that, 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 that's not really explaining how it is, what are the dynamic processes by which an infinite being, an infinite being, can create a finite world. And an infinite being that is not only infinite but completely completely holy completely good creates a world that is finite that is pluralistic that is full of crap how does that how do you get from one to the other this great question of how we bridge that so on the one hand yes we're going to have some emanatory theory, but it is utterly, utterly unique as to how the Ari arrives 
at the bridge between infinity and limitation. It has Neoplatonic elements, it has Gnostic elements, it has Rabbinic monotheism, but it is utterly unique. And he comes up with pretty much three totally original doctrines that go on to form a core part of Jewish thought. The first is God's existence is absolutely total. But the world is created out of nothing. So where is the nothing in a God that is everything? The Ari wants us to understand that before the world was created, God left the building. The first act of the divine is to create an absolute vacuum within itself. In the ultimate act of self-restraint, which he describes geometrically as some kind of circle, sphere within himself, within itself, in which the infinite dimension of the divine is withheld. That withholding is called what? Correct. That simtsum. Simtsum means contraction. But it doesn't mean that the divine is contracted into a small space. It means that the divine is contracted into itself. If the divine does not remove itself, this world could not exist. It would be simply overwhelmed by infinity. It comes close to the one question that physics cannot, by nature, answer. That is, not just what happened before, but why does anything exist at all? Why does anything exist at all? Would it not be easier and more kind of in line with things if things didn't exist? Yeah? The Ari's answer to that would be, well, they don't. But everything is within the divine, but the divine withholds its infinite modes in order to allow for the existence of plurality and finitude in a world. However, the divine then re-enters this space created for the worlds, re-enters by way of two different types of emanation. One of which, this is very, very deep material, and I'm absolutely superficially summarizing this for you. The divine enters into this space in two different types of emanation. One of which is circular, and one of which is linear. Both of those types of emanation enter into the space in the form of spherot. So when you see this diagram in Kabbalistic text, there's the infinite. Right? That's the process of Tzimtzum. There's the vacuum. God re-enters first as a series of spherot, ten spherot, in circular form. Yeah? They are going to be the basis 
of what is going to become nature. God then re-enters a new light into the vacuum, which is spherot emanated in linear form. And what does linear form imply? That, well, once we have lines, the human form. The human form. Now, those two are integrated, and then at some point, at some point, very complex, but I'm, I'm touching on a critical point, at some point, the light that enters into that space cannot be contained by the vessels that are holding it there. By the vessels that are holding it there. And the vessels that hold these lights, these lights obviously coming in in forms that once they arrive in the space, they create a vessel for new lights coming forward. But those vessels can't contain the light and they smash in a very catastrophic way in a process called Shvirat HaKelim, the smashing of the vessels. So we start off, wait, you'll see where I'm going. It's okay. I'm, I'm giving you the absolute redaction of this encounter. Tzimtzum is the act of contraction to create that circle. Shvirat HaKelim, which means the smashing of the vessels, is the second major event in this process of unfolding. The vessels smash. They smash because they cannot contain the light of the Sfirot. The Sfirot are coming from the infinite, attempting to be contained in this limited space. Can't handle it. The Sfirot smash. And they descend deeper into the abyss of the vacuum. And so God sends a new light called the power of Ma, which is, I mentioned this last week, the power of what? The power of the human. And it is the task of humanity to reconfigure and reconstruct and repair the vessels in order to contain the divine in a process that we know as Tikkun or Tikkun Olam. That whole idea that has now become so popular and understood by Jewish thought, the idea of Tikkun Olam is an idea that emerges from the Ari's entire picture of understanding the Zohar and the relationship between humanity and the world and particularly of the Jewish people in relation to humanity and the world and the divine. We are fixing this broken world in order to help it contain the divine. But I've only given a very superficial summary of Lurianic thought. It is vastly more complex than that. And what it does and what is it synthesizes and contains all previous dimensions of mystical and non-mystical thought. So everything that had already existed in the Jewish intellectual and textual tradition finds its account in the Ari, what it's doing and which level it's at. Yeah? Now... So you can already see in one way how influential those ideas have become. All processes, all historical processes happen through this dialectic. This is a 
processual dynamic of the Sfirot. The only way that the Sfirot can be contained in the finite universe and therefore the divine can be revealed within the, within the finite, because that was the reason for creation, so that God can be revealed on all levels, including the finite. The only way that can happen is through the integration of the Sfirot. So long as the Sfirot exist, just one under the other, they don't integrate. You need to integrate the Sfirot, which of course is a metaphor for the integration of all things. Our job is to integrate. Uh, what I haven't been able to mention is the fact that during the two, three hundred years since the Zohar to the Ari, uh, the later Zoharic literature, such as the Tikkunim and so on, have developed uh, further ideas that the Ari is now incorporating. One of those ideas is the idea of four worlds. There are four fundamental planes of existence. Anybody familiar with this? Okay, so I'm not going to fry your brains by going into that now, but there are four fundamental planes of existence called the world of emanation, which is very, very high, very close to God. Then the world of creation. That, by the way, is where the Ari tells you, is where all of that divine chariot sits. So all those guys that were going up there, they were going up to the world of creation, above which is the world of emanation, which is some kind of platonic realm of ideal forms. The world of creation, below that is the world of formation, which is the world of angels. And below that, each of these, these are not spatial worlds, they're here, these are spiritual, conceptual planes, but they are full universes. And below that is the world of action, the world of facts, the world that we inhabit. In fact, we only inhabit the malchut of the world of action. Now, that then became symbolized and, 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 and paralleled to a whole other development of post zoharic Kabbalah that the Ari picks up on that have to do with the levels of the soul. The level of the soul in the Zohar is three. There are three levels of the soul revealed in the Zohar. But by the time we get to the Ari, we have five levels of the soul. I'm telling you this because, not because I want you to try and memorize this information. If you're interested in Kabbalistic thought, then you go and you have that journey. I'm telling you this because our picture of the divine and its encounter with humanity and vice versa is undergoing waves of revelation from the 13th century onwards. But the Ari will take those five levels of the soul and he'll match them to the four levels of the world so he'll create a world beyond the fifth so that he can match it with the levels of the soul. All symbolic systems merge. Time. What is the ruling number of time? That means that time is created in the world of emanation by the fixing of the lower seven spherot. The day each of one represents a day of the week. The days of the week themselves are huge archons of spiritual influence. Everything, everything, everything gets synthesized. Everything gets synthesized. All systems. Astrological, Kabbalistic, alchemical, biological. I mean, I've even seen pages of of, of Vital of, of Chaim Vital's writings where it, it's basically Aristotelian rational thought about the divisions of the intellect explained according to his teacher's system. Everything is synthesized as we move forward. But of course, in the last few centuries, there have been multiple interpretations of Lurianic Kabbalah. In the course of the last few hundred years, of course, naturally in post lorianic Kabbalah, a lot of these ideas have been taken in different interpretive directions. Probably the most profound of which, and in the remaining few minutes I'm going to discuss this, because this is important to understand if we're talking in general about mystical encounters with the divine. 
and that is that what 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 really happened? The Zohar brought God very very close to us, and then in a way, by revealing more, the Ari in a sense pushed God back up. There is a way of reading the Ari where. Interestingly enough, because it's so revealed and so explicit, there's a kind of a disconnect because God becomes this abstract, almost geometric thing that's way, way beyond. In other words, it's fascinating and it can be very, very impactful in terms of meaning in the world. But how do I relate to that? And that is part, not only, but part of the reason for the... Uh, revolution that happens in the 18th century which is the Hasidic revolution bear in mind and I don't have time to go into this now but bear in mind that in the 17th century of course Lurianic Kabbalah was in a sense abused by people to create all sorts of strange ideologies it would be impossible for example to imagine the Sabbatean events without seeing them in the light of the influence of Lurianic Kabbalah. Had Nathan of Gaza not become Shabtai Tzvi's prophet, he probably would have been one of the great post-Lurianic Kabbalists. But instead he allied himself with Shabtai Tzvi. And he explains, after Shabtai Tzvi's apostasy, he still justifies it. He says that Shabtai Tzvi went into Islam to redeem the last remaining sparks that needed to be redeemed. He is the soul of the Messiah. Only he can go into that deep into the abyss. But that notwithstanding, all of these things create uh, vacuums. And in that vacuum moves the Hasidic movement into the 18th century. Now, the Hasidic movement is very difficult to define. We need just to look very briefly at the careers and thoughts of the early, early Hasidic movements, uh, leaders, because they are really the, the purest and the ones that, that give us the most essential ideas about Hasidism, which wanted to prioritize a concept I spoke about last week, the concept of dvekut, the concept of cleaving to God, in an intense and absolutely intense apprehension, the founder of the Hasidic movement, who was, of course, the Baal Shem of Israel Baal Shem, born 1698, died 1760. Israel Baal Shem developed a totally revolutionary systematic approach, but he himself is using Lurianic Kabbalah and the Zohar as his launch pad. He uses the same symbolism, but he brings it fully back into the existential world. Dvekut is not about an ascent that you have as a mystic with your talus over your head in a room with some candles lit by yourself. It is, in fact, everywhere. God's presence is everywhere. You don't need to go any further than your own backyard. And you can go for a walk in the forest, you can go to a town, you can be digging lime from pits, and you will see God. Because every single thing that reality presents to you is presented to you because God wants it to be so. So every single moment and every single thing. No leaf falls from a tree, says the Baal Shem Tov, without God wanting that leaf to fall from that tree at that moment for a purpose. And if you witness it, it means that there is something to be learnt from that about God. Everything is hashgacha pratit. That is very, very particular divine providence. The Baal Shem Tov also prioritized joy as a fundamental spiritual approach. Now, all of those things notwithstanding, the Baal Shem Tov himself has a very famous letter that is attributed to him um, called the Baal Shem Tov's letter, which he wrote to his brother-in-law, Gershon of Kitov. 
in which he describes his own ascent, because he himself had his own ascent techniques. One of the things that came out of Lurianic Kabbalah, out of uh, Vital's work and so on, is this idea of Yichudim, this idea of uh, being able, once again, drawing on older Kabbalistic strands, but being able to combine certain letters of the divine name in a certain way to effect certain states of consciousness. In one of these, the Baal Shem Tov describes an ascent he had. And that's ironic, because the Baal Shem Tov in the 18th century is writing a letter describing an ascent experience he has that's much more of an echo of something 2,000 years before in the Talmudic period with Merkava mysticism. But what's different about this is that he doesn't just go upstairs to see the divine chariot and go, ah, oh, I'm amazed and then come back down, he wanders through the corridors up there until he finds the chamber in which is sitting the Messiah. And he famously says to the Messiah, what does he say? To, what is the most? It's a very, very famous uh, quote for very, uh, the Baal Shem Tov's letter. What, what does he say to the Messiah there? He's, oh, a matai ka'atimar. He says to him in Aramaic, when is the master coming? And the Messiah turned around and said to him, when, huh? Well, no, that is the classic answer. That's the answer that the Talmud will give you, right? Today, if you want it, today, if you do teshuvah. But the answer given to the Baal Shem Tov is famously When your wellsprings spread forth externally. In other words, when your teachings and your spiritual approach becomes universal and, and widespread and known, the Messiah will come. That's one of the great existential drives behind the Hasidic movement. Now, for all sorts of historical reasons that we're not going into now, for all sorts of historical reasons, over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, most Hasidic movements became cloistered and reactionary and conservative and not radical and revolutionary. They're not interested in everybody else being Hasidim. They're looking after their own communities with the notable exception of a couple of those movements, of the Hasidic movements from the 18th century, notably Chabad, who are constantly out there trying to get everybody else to be Chabad. And because they, they feel, and they'll tell you, is real. And the other would be uh, the teachings of Nachman of Braslav, Rabbi Nachman. Now, in the remaining one minute, I'm going to talk to you about Chabad and Nachman's <laughs> philosophy, which fill thousands of books and thousands of pages of thought. Uh, so Chabad famously, famously um, sees mystical encounters with the divine as happening not up there and not even necessarily in the world, but in the self. Chabad has developed in its ideal sense. Chabad is not about guys running around trying to put tefillin on everybody and talking about the Messiah. That is extremely late, Chabad. Well, well it's extremely late. That's, that's, that, that's the last half a century. But the, or th the, the original idea of Chabad is a system of meditative approaches to prayer and to life in which the top three sfirot, Chochmah Bina Da'at, which, which is what Chabad stands for, which is what Chabad stands for, the intellectual faculties control the passions. It is a huge psychological and phenomenological journey into self-control. And through self-control one comes to enlightenment. It has huge crossovers with Eastern thought, of which most Chabad uh, people are completely unaware of. Scholars are aware of it, but it is 
the hugely important meditative system, usually particularly applied to prayer, but also in one's daily life. Immense control over one's emotions. Because the midot, the emotions, need to be controlled by the intellect. Its primary text is the Tanya and so on. Rabbi Nachman's spiritual system, which is... Braslav is probably the most, the fastest growing Jewish movement in the world today. Orthodox spiritual Jewish movement. Rabbi Nachman has an extremely unique way of encountering the divine. It's interesting that I'm ending this course on him. Because in some ways... Like the famous story, you know, like in former days they used to do miracles and so on. Now we just talk about them. But there is a way of encountering the divine that Rabbi Nachman gives you. And that is through a process called Hit Bodedut, which is isolated meditation or meditative isolationism. That is that you go into a place by yourself, but not a room, somewhere in nature, either a forest or a beach and you walk and you talk and you talk to God out loud you walk and as you walk you talk anyone seen the film Ushbizin? Yes. yes. that beautiful film yes. that couple in that film were brats lovers that's why he goes into that forest and he talks to God and you talk to God in the second person you and you tell God about your issues and you tell God about your thoughts and you tell God about how you feel about God and you tell God about how you feel about everything. This is an incredible kind of one-on-one -on -one therapy session with the creator of the universe. No, but the idea of Hishtabchut Nefesh in Rabbi Nachman, the idea of pouring out one's soul is a very, very tough process. It's not easy. It's not just turn around and go, hey God, you know, can I, can I win the lottery next week? It is a, it is a very, very, it, it, it's an exercise in absolute honesty and authenticity. You have to be aware of who you're speaking to. But you speak out loud, you go for long walks by yourself for hours. And it, it, it is an encounter with the divine that is utterly transformative. And people that do this as a spiritual practice are very, very high level and enlightened people. I have arrived at the end of this course. Thank you, Thank you. We have so much that we have not talked about. I do have some notes that contain some of the things we talked about in weeks three and four. I've realised, as I'm sure, I've realised, as I'm sure you have, that this topic is much vaster than we can do it here. I have only skimmed over the surface. It starts with, it's really a more like an overview survey of Jewish mystical ideas. We started with the Merkava and we ended up with Rabbi Nachman. Yep. Uh, going from the divine chariot to walks along in the forest. But at the end of the day, Jewish thought is incredibly synthetic. It draws from everywhere, but it is all part of the ongoing attempt for us to understand our place in the world and our relationship with God. And that is, at the end of the day, the, the question that all mystics are trying to answer. It's not just about trying to have some trip or to apprehend. It's trying to understand the meaning and, of what we're doing here and to allow that meaning to, meaning to invade our lives so we live useful and productive existences. And on that level, I wish you all um, the very best. I will see you again. Thank you for listening. To find out more about David Solomon's books, recordings and classes, or to support his work and teachings for just a few dollars a month, visit davidsolomon.online.